Hi, I'm Rodrigo Silva, the Communications Manager at Cogitatio. Welcome to the first episode of Let's Talk About Politics and Governance. Our guest today is Cynthia Ritchie Terrell from Represent Women, an organization based in the US devoted to gender balanced representation. Cynthia will talk with us today about ranked choice voting and women's representation. Her article, co authored with Courtney Lamandola and Maura Riley, both from Represent Women as well, is called Election Reform and Women's Representation Ranked Choice Voting in the US, and was published last year in our open access journal, Politics and Governance. Cynthia, it's a pleasure to have you here with us. It's great to be here. Thank you. I would start to ask you to tell us a bit about ranked choice voting in the U.S. So a brief context before we jump to your article. Uh, yes, that's a great question, because I think that um, listeners may not appreciate uh, how much of an anomaly the American electoral system is. We have a um, uh, we have primary elections. We're a presidential system. We have an electoral college, which no other country in the world um, operates under, and uh, we still use a winner-take-all system. We're first past the post, which we, like Canada and um, Australia and New Zealand, inherited from the UK uh, 250 years ago, when that's what the system was that was, was used for designing governments. Um, since then, of course, uh, the, the concept of proportional representation has really evolved, I think, in its many forms as the gold standard for uh, for voting and electoral methods. And, and it takes many forms. We see around the world, every continent, actually, I'm, I guess not Antarctica, but every continent pretty much uses some form or another of proportional representation. But the United States, um, for a number of reasons, is still really, I would say, mired down in our winner-take-all, zero-sum game politics. And I think the events of the last few years um, have illustrated in almost tragic ways the impact of having um, an electoral system that is almost designed to um, tamp down the role of voters and to de-incentivize the ability of elected officials to work together on policies that address the problems we all are facing. Thank you. And to bridge uh, so ranked choice voting and women representation, so specifically in the case of women representation, has ranked choice voting facilitated the process throughout the years? Yes, um, that's a great question. Uh, the United States has has always been an outlier um, among its allies in terms of the representation of women. Um, there was a time some years ago when the United States ranked, I think, 102nd uh, for women's representation now. Uh, we've crept up. We're in the 70s now. And among OECD countries, um, I think we rank maybe 37th or something like that. Um, so the representation of women in the United States is low. And um, as a reminder, in this big year, breakthrough year, 2022, midterm elections, redistricting happened, uh, we've added one woman to the House of Representatives. So we now have 124 women in the House. We had 123 before the elections we see um, a tiny bit more progress happening at the local or municipal level uh, for women's representation, but it's still less than a third of all elected representatives. Um, our uh, seats are held by women. Um, the, the, uh, the exciting data point that uh, we studied in this paper and is ongoing for us is looking at the jurisdictions that have moved on uh, beyond the winner take all voting system and have embraced uh, ranked choice voting or instant runoff voting in the United States. And uh, there are some early adopters of this in the Bay Area where we've done some in the United States, that's um, Northern California, Oakland, San Francisco, Berkeley, um, in Minnesota, Minneapolis, and St. Paul, thanks to the great work of, of, of Jean Massey and her team at Fair Vote Minnesota. Um, and then in jurisdictions now around the country, um, thanks to uh, Fair Vote and to Rank the Vote US and other groups that are really focused on it, mm -hmm. we've seen um, a big uptake in the number of women getting elected. And um, 
while this is consistent across all the jurisdictions um, with ranked choice voting, that the percentage of women is higher. I think the average is about 30 for both mayors and city councils um, that the in jurisdictions with ranked choice voting, women hold 47% of the seats. Um, we see in cities like New York City that adopted ranked choice voting or readopted it, I should say, after using it um, in the last century, women now hold 61% of seats. And um, New York is obviously such a huge case study. There are just so many millions of uh, people who live in New York City. That's been a really great um, model to look at because we saw um, sort of in living um, uh, uh, an example of how the system in enabled more women to run without splitting the vote. It meant that endorsing organizations endorsed more than one uh, candidate at the same time, often more than one woman candidate, which engaged more voters in the process. It gave voters a better sense of power in the process to elect a candidate of choice. And because in a ranked choice voting system, um, Candidates have an incentive to find common ground because they want to attract supporters of their opponents to rank them second or third. There's a, a built in incentive for civility and for issue focus, which really transforms the process of the election. Um, so that was super exciting to see. And um, as I as I said, women hold 61 percent of seats mm -hmm. in in New York City. And I think the data shows that 80 percent of the women on the New York City Council are women of color under the age of 40. And so it, it transforms the, um, not only who is, who is on the council descriptively, but I think we're seeing now how it transforms the, the lived experiences of the policymakers and thus the, the kinds of policy uh, that that is established from those councils. Well, of course, I, I was gonna ask, uh how could these results or could this background that you gave us impact public po policies or individual choice? But I think uh, that this yeah. contextualization that you did uh, fairly responds to our question. So now jumping on to your article specifically, so what are the main findings? Well, in the article, we um, realized that there wasn't really a comprehensive um, uh, history of proportional representation or ranked choice voting in the United States. And we we set out to offer sort of a thumbnail to that history um, to describe the use of ranked choice voting um, in the during the progressive era in the in the 1930s and 40s in the United States. And in many ways that established the context for the we knew that it had had an impact on the election of women and of men of color um, in the 1930s and 40s in an era when it was even more unheard of for women um, or black men, for example, to get elected. So that was that was uh, interesting for us to, to, to dive into that research and understand um, uh, the history there. Uh, we also then um, look at the data uh, that was true as of uh, 2021 in terms of the jurisdictions which were using ranked choice voting and the impact on women, both for executives, uh, mayoral uh, seats held by women, and then on city councils. And so those were the um, the main um, the areas that we were looking at in terms of the data. Um, so that was really exciting to, you know, as as you can imagine and 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 listeners can imagine, it's important to chart and really track what the data is telling us. If we're advocating for policies, we want to make sure we're really understanding not only what the numbers tell us, but what the the qualitative experiences of candidates are in these systems. So I would say that uh, research that we did uh, was a really good way to establish a base point. And now as millions more Americans are using ranked choice voting and we see more data, um, we will add to that research. And I think that will be a really good, um, record of what the impact of, a, of ranked choice voting has been. Mm -hmm. Very good. And before we look, uh, ahead into the future, the article you co-authored had dozens of thousands of views, uh, on our website only, not counting all the debates that came with it. The research was published in June 2021, so more than a year ago. And uh, where do we stand now when it comes to ranked choice voting and women representation? 
So what? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I could talk for a long time about that, but I'll try to be short. I mean, I'll try to be brief. Um, We saw a number of jurisdictions use ranked choice voting. Um, Well, one, the primary in New York City was in June. We saw those women win in November. So that was exciting. So we we now can um, focus and understand how that worked. I will say that one of the um, reasons for the success in, in New York City was that there's a terrific organization called New Majority New York City that specifically recruited women to run for those positions and um, helped uh, them run an effective ranked choice voting campaign. Um, and I think uh, just anticipating a question you might ask me, which is, um, how can we make sure that ranked choice voting is successfully implemented across the, the country? I would say um, the, the research that Rep- Represent Women has done is uh, focused on how we can really take full advantage of that. And that involves an organization like New Majority um, exporting that model to other jurisdictions. So where it's used in a state like Maine or a state like Alaska, mm-hmm. women um, are being recruited to run and supported when they when they run. Notwithstanding the fact that there is not a new majority uh, New York City in Alaska or anywhere else right now, yet um, women did quite well in Alaska and and in Maine as well. And we saw, in fact, in contentious primaries in Alaska um, with some candidates who were backed by the former president of the United States, that that uh, Representative Mary Peltola was elected, who's a, a Democrat. Um, no Democrat had ever held that seat. It had been held by a Republican, Don Young, until his death. Um, he held it for 50 years. And uh, a Republican, Lisa Murkowski, um, won in the Senate in Alaska. So we see that that those are really hopeful signs, not only because we think that they really reflect the views of Alaska voters who are pro-fish and tro- pro-job and pro-choice. I think that was the motto of, of Representative Peltola. But we see that as a really a way forward in this contentious era of American politics, that a system like ranked choice voting really delivers the candidate whom the majority of voters want. And that seems to me to be one of the most important underpinnings of a um strong democracy is having representatives in office whom the majority of voters want. So uh, we see good news for women on that front. Women um, now hold 47% of seats on uh, in jurisdictions with ranked choice voting, both for mayor and for city council. And that's about that's that's almost 20 percent higher than non non RCV cities. So we see that that's pretty remarkable in terms of the, what the data tells us. No, and it's very interesting. It reflects uh, the, how the research and the data that you collect have real impact uh, on on politics, on on uh, political action and campaigning. So that's very interesting. We, what I would ask what, to ask you now is what's now uh, left to research. So you mentioned before that there is research ongoing. Uh, you do uh, this research on national level, at the local level. You also mentioned before. Uh, that New York is a good case study. Um, so what's now ahead to to research on the topic? Yeah, I think that there, um, I think more research is needed on the best model. I mentioned the New York City, the new majority idea. Um, we want to track how many women are running for these seats, because of course that impacts how many women win, <laughs> is to really understand how many and what kinds of women are running and how they are supported. Um, We also want to look at the jurisdictions that are using the multi-winner form of ranked choice voting, which has just been adopted in Portland, Oregon and Portland, Maine, which is the same system that the Australian Senate uses, um, where you elect multiple representatives in a geographic area with a ranked system. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons that's particularly important to us is that in Australia, in the Senate, women hold 57% of the seats in that body. Um, And so that seems like a particularly auspicious thing for us to understand. It also happens to be the model that we're pushing for uh, Congress, uh, the Fair Representation Act. So we really want to understand how to, not only how to advocate for that, what, why it is that more women are getting elected in these multi-seat elections in the United States. I'm in Maryland right now in a multi-seat election with winner take all voting, but we want to understand how ranked choice voting and and uh, multi winner seats or districts um, uh, strengthen the opportunities for women and others who are marginalized from the political process. 
Mm -hmm. We're also um, interested in looking at the use of ranked choice voting in other contexts, like what would be the impact on um, using ranked choice voting to select presidential nominees, because that's that's upcoming in 2024. We're going to have a big presidential election in the United States. So how can we use ranked choice voting to make sure there are fair and representative outcomes? Um, we're also intrigued by the um, the role of money. Uh, we know that um, we did a study, well, we first did it when we were still a project of fair vote in 2015 on the extent to which um, uh, our current voting system requires candidates to spend a lot of money. The preliminary research that we've done is that women can win in a place like New York City without spending as much money, but given that money play such a major role in American politics, we want to understand the intersection of money and voting systems as well. Of course, there's still a lot of uh, paths forward to be explored. Uh, yes. Very, very interesting. Can you provide, so in this sense, some additional resources about the topics that we are discussing today, articles or webinars, uh, podcasts? So can you recommend more materials for uh, people to explore this topic? And of Absolutely. course, in this, um, in this if you, context, if you... by the way, let me tell you, some self-promotion is allowed to talk about uh, <laughs> represent women. Well, if you go to um, the Represent Women YouTube account, you'll find um, some good sessions that we did um, with um, with New York officials, one featuring the Attorney General of New York, uh, Letitia James, and some of the newly elected city councilors. That's on our YouTube channel, where they delve into the experience of running with ranked choice voting. So I would, I would push that forward. Um, we also had a great Democracy Solution Summit in March of 2022. We're going to do that every year where we bring together women uh, leaders in the democracy reform work. And there are some good sessions there on ranked choice voting with some good new voices. Um, you can find that on the, the Represent Women YouTube channel as well. We've also just refreshed our website, making it easier to um, search by our content. We have a lot of content now on ranked choice voting. We're still in the process of transitioning everything over, but um, I hope people will find that filtering system there useful. You can look for ranked choice voting and filter by multi-seat districts and filter by other kinds of outcomes. So I think, I hope that will be useful. We also are, um, continuing our focus on international women's representation to understand what the best practices are. So you can find that uh, international dashboard on our website. We'll be releasing a report on um, on uh, Pacific nations like Australia and New Zealand, where I think there's some really great information on how voting systems have changed the dynamic for women in both those countries, which as a reminder, also inherited the winner take all first past the post system from the UK. But um, I think both would say both those countries are glad that they departed from that and adopted proportional and, and uh, semi-proportional systems of government. There are also great other websites. Fair Vote does a great job. Rank the Vote USA. United America is now much more of a spokesperson, spokes group, I guess you would say, on um, ranked choice voting. And there's just so many more ranked choice voting advocates out there now. It's pretty exciting to type into Twitter. If people still use Twitter, type in ranked choice voting and you'll see some of the conversations that are happening about the, the reform in the United States. No, of course, a very, very interesting uh, talk, Cynthia. And we have gone uh, in this uh, episode through a background on ranked choice voting uh, in the United States, its uh, impact on women's representation, uh, how it translates really into uh, political action with more or less success and of course some uh, paths forward when it comes to research and i i would always i would ask to like to ask you as a closing statement we always do uh, in the end of our episodes if there is anything you want our audience to remember about this talk so if all the discussion that we did uh, the punchline that you want people to uh, go home with in their heads what would it be i would say that the the pressing problems of the world, whether it's climate or economics or militarism or social security justice issues, all of them require um, the best and the brightest involved at the decision making table. And we just we we see data that shows that more women's voices and lived experiences 
are um, a requirement for better policy outcomes um, and better process in government. And I think the United States has such a outsized role in the world. I think it's incumbent upon us in the United States to be as innovative as we can in pushing for gender balance and pushing forward um, all women into more leadership so that we can help solve these pressing problems. Thank you, Cynthia, for being with us today. The, the article is available on the journal's website, and this episode is available on the Let's Talk About Politics and Governance website, as well as on Koji.tu's YouTube channel and podcast directories. Thank you, Cynthia, for being here with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. See you on our next episode. Sounds great. <laughs>